Good day, viewers. Welcome back to my physics class. Today's topic will be focused on alternating current, and these are the basic topics we'll be dealing with. We will first of all talk about the definition of basic terms, phase diagrams or phase diagrams of AC circuits, and the components that are normally focused in, in, in building an alternating current circuit. And we'll also talk about the different types of AC circuits. First of all, I would like to give the definition of an alternating current, but I believe you all have been reading and you know what an alternating current is. It simply refers to the voltage or current that changes polarity or direction periodically. Such currents are normally produced by an alternating current generator. And the decrease or the change in the direction is due to the, what, to the changes that happen uh, after each cycle or after half a cycle. Now, when we talk about alternating current, the first thing that comes to your mind is that the voltage produced or the current that has been produced alternates between zero to a maximum value and then gets back to zero and then it decreases in the, in the negative direction. So, there, therefore, all AC generators or all, how to call it, all AC circuits will produce a voltage of, you know, something like this in this nature. It goes to a maximum, then gets to zero, then it will then increase in the opposite direction. Now, in each half a cycle, this alternation will just occur. It will just be changing direction from zero to a maximum and then to zero back to another minimum value. This is different from, a, from direct current in which the current will always be constant or the voltage will always be constant, regardless of the time or the, the period you've undergone. Understood? Now, the reason why this AC or AC voltages or generators alternate is because the, 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 the current is being produced by a generator, which normally rotates at a constant frequency, which we call omega. Now, if you look at this graph, it resembles that of a sine curve, and all sine curves are guided by this general equation, y equals to a sine theta. I believe you recall this equation when you studied uniform circular motion, or how to call it, simple harmonic motion. All periodic motions are guided by this general equation. But since we are dealing with AC, or alternating current, the y-axis will be replaced with the voltage that we are talking about, or the current, and that gives us A. A will also be substituted as V naught, and this gives us sine theta. If you recall from your study of mag magnetism, you will notice that the A here refers to the maximum displacement from the, from the point of equilibrium, or just the peak amplitude. The same thing applies. When we talk about the amplitude here, we are referring to the peak or maximum voltage. That's it. And this will be time t. I think that part is understood. We should also recall that this sine wave is being produced as a result of a constant, constant frequency. frequency when, when a current is passed through a uniform through a uniform field. Now if you observe the diagram, you will notice that the maximum voltage recorded will be noted, noted as V naught, and this is what we call the peak or maximum voltage. And theta, from our study of uniform circular motion or simple harmonic motion, theta was defined as omega times t, where omega is just the constant frequency that we are just mentioning here. So if we insert this equation into the general equation that guides all rotational motion, or all periodic motion, we will have something like the voltage at any time t will be v naught sine omega t, since theta is given us omega t. So we, we are done with that of the voltage, and the same thing applies to the current. 
the current will also be alternating due to the mag uniform magnetic field and also the coil being rotated or being rotated at a constant frequency. So we will have I equivalent to I naught sine omega t. And that graph can also be drawn as something like this, where I naught refers to the peak or maximum current. And this is time t. So the current at any instant is given as I naught sine omega t. And I showed you how that omega t was obtained. Good. We move on to something else. Whenever we deal with electricity or current, what comes to your mind is the power that is being consumed or being produced. Now, the power consumed is given us, if you recall, the instantan power or instantaneous power is given us the current times the voltage. But here, since we are dealing with AC, I is given as V naught sine omega T, and V is also given as V naught sine omega T. So when these are substituted into this equation, the instantaneous power, the power will be I naught sine omega T times V naught sine omega T. And this simplified gives us I naught sine squared omega t. And this is what we call the instantaneous power supply in an AC circuit. Good. Now to obtain the effective current, we refer to it as the IRMS values. And the IRMS values are two. Whenever we deal with AC, there are two things that always keeps repeating. When we call current, Voltage must also be mentioned. So when I say RMS values, the first thing we're dealing with will be the VRMS value. And the VRMS value talks about the effective or the total voltage. It is the effective or total voltage in an AC circuit. Good. And when we talk about the, the, the RMS values, or the effective current and, and voltage values, there are points that you're supposed to note. And here, the first point we will note is that the average of the peak voltage will always be zero. The average of the peak voltage will always be zero at any time t. But then, the other point is that the average of the peak voltage all squared at any given time will be equivalent to the effective current, which we call, not the effective current, the effective voltage, which we call VRMS all squared. I think you, you've, you've read this once in your lifetime. So we're going to, turn to all of our variation or derivation will be based on this point. Is that understood? Those of you that have offered further math or are doing, how to call it, core maths, you should know how to go on with this. We can simplify this part to make VRMS the subject. And that gives us VRMS is equivalent to the root of V naught squared all over 2. And this part can also be simplified because the root of V naught squared will always be V naught all over. The root of 2 will be root of 2. So VRMS will be equivalent to V naught all over the root of 2. But then we know V naught to be the peak voltage, but then R root 2 is just a constant. So we can simplify this one further by rationalizing the denominator. And when we do that, it becomes VRMS, that is the effective voltage, will be equivalent to V naught, the root of 2, all over root 2 times root 2. And that whole thing gives us VRMS is equivalent to V naught root 2 all over. Root 2 times root 2 gives us what? 2. Therefore, the VRMS, or the effective voltage, in an AC circuit will be given as V naught all over, V naught root 2 all over 2, and root 2 divided by root 2. Root 2 divided by 2 gives us 0 0.7071. 
not forgetting that V0. So if you are required to calculate the effective voltage in an AC circuit, it will always be 0 0.7071 times V0, where V0 is the maximum, maximum voltage. Have I communicated? V0 is measured in volts, and VRMS is also measured in volts. I hope this part is understood. Let us move on to the IRMS value. The same definition, nothing changes. When we talk about IRMS, we simply refer to the effective current stored in an AC circuit. IRMS refers to the effective current, the effective current in an AC circuit. It is also measured in amperes because that is the SI unit of current. Is that understood? Good. Then we note these following points. The first point is that the average, when we talk about average, you know what it means? The average of the peak current at any time t is giving us zero. That's the first thing you need. And the second point tells us that the average of the peak current all squared at any given time will be equivalent to IRMS all squared. Now, to obtain the IRMS value, we can simplify this. We just perform some operation on it, and that gives us IRMS is equivalent to, we take the root of both sides, and this will be the root of I0 squared all over 2. So IRMS will obviously be, the root of I0 squared will be I0, because the root will cancel 2. Root of 2 is the same as root 2. Therefore, if we rationalize this, IRMS becomes I0 root 2 all over root 2 times root 2. And root 2 times root 2 will obviously give us 2. So this can be written as IRMS is equivalent to 0.7071 I0, where IRMS is the effective or total current stored in the circuit, and then I0 equivalent to the peak or maximum current in the circuit. Now we are going to shift our attention to phase or diagrams or a phase current and voltage. Now this is why I said the phase diagram just shows the magnitude of the current and that of the voltage together with the angle that acts between the two. The angle is referred to as the phase difference or phase angle. Is that understood? So in, in other words, it is just a vector diagram which shows the magnitude and direction of the current, voltage, and the angle that is in between the current and the voltage. Have I communicated? Now, in drawing a phase diagram, you need to adapt these steps. The first thing you need to do, this is just conventionally, it is not compulsory to do, but I think if you follow these rules, you wouldn't have any problems in drawing a phase diagram. Whenever you are to draw a phase diagram, you need two lines, a vertical line and a horizontal line. Usually, the horizontal line will give the direction and magnitude, direction and magnitude of the current. And the second line will be vertical. And this line can be vertically up or vertically down. Then the arrow should show the direction, to show the direction whether it is vertically up or vertically down. When we use a vertical line with an arrowhead with that points upwards, it means the voltage, it means the voltage leads the current. And when the arrowhead points to the ground or downwards, it means that voltage lacks the current. Is that understood? Good. Now, that's all for phase diagrams. Now, let's talk about the AC circuit components. AC circuit components. AC circuit components are the simplest of all types because they just make use of three components, and these components are the resistor. We all know what a resistor is when we studied DC. A resistor opposes the flow of current, and the property that enables it to oppose the flow of current in a circuit is called resistance. 
Resistance is the property which enables it to oppose the flow of current in an electric. Capacitors are used to store charges temporarily, right? And, and the, the ability for capacitor to store charge is known as capacitance. Is known as capacitance. And the SI unit of capacitance is FRAD. The other small units of capacitance might include microfrad, millifrad, and so on. And the third component is usually a coil of wire, which we refer to as an inductor. An inductor L. The inductor opposes the flow of current, or the di it changes the direction of flow of current. Is that understood? And the ability of an inductor to do that is known as inductance, and the SI unit of inductance is Henry, capital H. So these are the three circuit components we have, and usually to build a circuit component, or a circuit component here, we, or a circuit diagram, we will just need one or two, or all three combined. Now the first one we are going to study is dealing with the, the components individually. The first type of AC circuit we have is the pure resistance circuit. And when I say a pure resistance circuit, it means there is only resistance present. There is only resistance present in this circuit and all other components are absent, they are missing. And that is how the circuit will be, since it is a pure, pure resistance or pure resistor circuit. The circuit is made up of a resistor. Since it is alternating, we should show the direction of voltage, showing that this is an alternating current. And if you recall what I said earlier on, the alternating current will always occur when frequency is constant. So whenever you deal with alternating current or alternating circuit, you should notice that the voltage will always go together with the frequency at which the inductor or all these components will, will rotate. Is that understood? So this is V, that's R. Let us see what happens in this, comp in this component. This will be V sub R. And this is the magnitude of current or the f direction in which current flows. If you observe, there is the total or effective voltage is stored here and it is donated as V, but then VR is just the voltage across the resistor. In a, in a pure capacitance, not capacitance, in a pure resistance circuit, like I said, only resistor is present. Only resistor is present. That's the first thing you note. The second thing you note is that the current and the voltage rise and fall together. I and V will rise and fall together. Will rise and fall together. And this simply tells us that there is no angle or no phase angle in between the two. There is no phase angle since the current and voltage rise and fall together. Is that understood? And the opposition to the flow of current is called the opposition to the flow of current is the resistor. It is only the resistor that opposes the flow of current in this circuit. And then we have to formulate an equation that guides this particular circuit. The equation will be, equation of electricity is always, you know, guided by Ohm's law of electricity, which states that P is directly proportional to current, provided that temperature is constant. But like I said, V is just the only, R is the only component acting, and it varies directly as I, and they fall and rise together. So this simply tells us that VRMS in this circuit will be equivalent to IRMS times the total resistance. The only opposition to the flow of current is offered by the resistance, and that is it. We know VRMS to be the effective voltage, and IRMS to be the effective voltage. Please take note of this equation. Is that understood? That's the first type, and you have to note all these points that I gave you. Now we move on to the second type. That one deals with the pure capacitor.
What do we know about this circuit? Mm -hmm. Only capacitors are present. Only capacitors are present. We call the voltage across the capacitor. The voltage across the capacitor will be V sub C. V sub C is the voltage across the capacitor. But then in this case, I and VC are out of phase. I and V are out of phase. And this means there is an angle between the two. There is an angle between them. Between them. And this angle is what we call the phase angle. And it is denoted as C. That's the symbol. Good. And the since there is a phase diagram or there is a phase angle, we should know that, you know, both current and voltage cannot be in line. One has to lead the other. And in this case, the current I leads the voltage. It leads the voltage by 90 degrees. So you can also use the other units. It can also be converted to radian and cycle. But if you recall from your study of uniform circular motion, you were told that one cycle will give us 360 degrees, and that is equivalent to 2 pi radians. So if you want to know what other units or what other units the voltage leads the current, you can just use this conversion to obtain it. And in order to, to save time, I will just give it to you. I lead the voltage by 90 degrees or by pi over 2 radians or by 1 fourth a cycle. Is that understood? Now we move on to a phaser diagram. Remember we said there is an angle between I and V. So to indicate that angle, we use a phase diagram. And initially, I explained what a phase diagram is. And you are also told that the horizontal line will always represent the direction and magnitude of the current. And the voltage will be represented by a vertical component. And I also said if voltage leads, it should point vertically upwards. But then if it lacks the current, it should point vertically downwards. Now, how do we draw this phase diagram? Can you give it a try? OK, you can verify with my own diagram. Current, that's the horizontal line, that's the direction. And then what are we told? If you look at point 3, we are told that I leads the voltage by 90. So I leads the voltage, meaning the voltage must be vertically downwards. Is that understood? And this gives us V of C. Have I communicated? Good. These are the only important things we, we needed. But then, let me just add up one thing. Point number four. Point number four. You should note that the opposition, since there is no resistor and there is a presence of current, we should know that there should be something which opposes this flow of current. And that which opposes the flow of current is what we called reactants. Reactance is just the, the, the opposition to the flow of current offered by, you know, an AC circuit which is made up of a capacitor or an inductor. Remember, if we are dealing with the pure resistor, the opposition to the flow of current will be done by the resistor. So you don't need the reactance there. Is that understood? But in simple sense, the reactance is just the same as the, 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 the resistance or the resistance, yes. Because it will also be measured in Newton since it does the same job as that of a resistor. Good. Now, the opposition to the flow of current in a pure capacitor circuit is called, it is called capacitance reactance, and it is donated as QC. QC is called capacitance reactance. And it opposes the flow of current in a pure capacitor circuit. Its unit is ohms. You should note that. So we use Newton, not Newton's laws. Let us use which law again? Ohm's law of electricity. 
we know V is equivalent to I times R. But in this pure circuit of capacitor, we know that the work that R does is being done by XC. So it means in place of R, I will just write XC. So R is substituted as XC. Is that understood? Good. Then the VRMS, which is the effective voltage, will be the effective current times the, the, the opposition to the flow of current, which I call XC. Is that understood? Can we make XC the subject from here? Yes, we should be able to. So XC will be equivalent to VRMS all over IRMS. This is one equation provided that X, provided that V and R are known, the values of V and R is given, then XC can be found using this equation. If that is not the case, you should also be able to show that XC is equivalent to 1 over omega times C. Omega will always be present because without omega, alternating current will not be produced or alternating voltage. Is that understood? But then from your study of simple harmonic motions and UCM, we know that omega is equivalent to the distance all over the time. But then the distance is just called the 2 pi radian, which is all over T, which is just the period. And you notice that period is also 1 over F. Since period and F uh, and frequency are inverses of each other, so T will be 1 over F. And this gives us the omega will be 2 pi F. So the other equation we can obtain for the reactants or capacitance reactants will be Xc equals to 1 over omega C. But then we already formulated an equation for omega, which is 2 pi. Therefore, Xc becomes 1 all over 2 pi F times C. If you recall from the, from the first part, I told you that the, the, resist, the opposition to the flow of current is being offered by a resistor. But then in this case, we have a pure capacitor circuit. And then the opposition to the flow of current in this circuit is being offered by the capacitative reactance, which is denoted as Xc, and it has the same unit as ohms. It has the same unit as resistance because it does the work of a resistor in a pure capacitor circuit. Is that understood? Now, if we use Ohm's law, we will see that V is directly proportional to IR, but then in this case, R is equivalent to XC. Then VRMS will be IRMS times XC, and that gives us XC equivalent to VRMS all over IRMS. That's the first equation you've observed. But then in a case where all of these variables are not given, we have to, come to, we have to formulate another equation for X, uh, the capacitative reactance, which will be 1 all over omega C, and this gives us 1 all over omega C, where omega will be theta over T, and T will be 1 over F. All this substituted will give us omega equivalent to 2 pi F. Therefore, the capacitative reactants of a capacitor will be Xc equivalent to 1 over omega C, which is the same as 1 all over 2 pi Fc. And Xc, we know, is the capacitative, capacitative, Inductant reactants, reactants. F is the frequency at which the coil rotates, and C or we, uh, F is the, the frequency at which the generator rotates, and C is the capacitance of the capacitor. Yeah. Then we move on to the third type, and that should be a pure inductant circuit. We move on to the third type, and that should be a pure inductor circuit. A pure inductor circuit. And as the name suggests, it is only an inductor which, of, which is present. We should draw it like, forgive my diagram, OK? That is it. 
and this gives us the voltage across the inductor which we call V sub L and that's the direction in which current flows. Okay. Now you have to note that it is only inductor that is present inductor is present there is a phase there is a phase difference between the current and the voltage number 3 the current lacks the voltage by 90 degrees which is equivalent to 2 which is equivalent to pi over 2 radians and 1 fourth a cycle now this point can also be stated as the voltage leads the current by 90 degree pi over 2 radian and 1 fourth cycles. Is that understood? Good. Now we move on to drawing the phase diagram of a pure inductor cycle. We just applied the rules. The horizontal line will give us the direction of the current. That is I. And the direction of voltage will be represented with a vertical line and then it can be vertically up or vertically downwards. But then if you look at this case, it's the voltage that leads, so it means the arrow must be pointed vertically upwards. And that will be V of L. Is that understood? The opposition offered by this circuit is known as the inductive, the inductive reactance. The inductive reactance just opposes the flow of current in this particular circuit and it is donated as XL. Mathematically, it is given as XL is equivalent to omega times L, where omega is 2 pi where omega is 2 pi F Therefore, XL is also given as 2 pi F, 2 pi F times L, where L is the inductance measured in Henry, F is the frequency measured in Hertz, and then 2 pi is just a constant. 2 pi is just a constant, and this can also tell us that the inductive reactance varies directly as F if L is kept as a constant. So we also know that XL varies directly as L. Did I say L? That is wrong. XL varies directly as F. And a graph of XL against F will be a linear graph. A graph of XL against F will give us a linear graph, something like this, since they vary directly. Good. Now we'll do the same thing for the other types. Remember, we dealt with the first type, but the graphs were not drawn. So we move on to the second type that we dealt with. From the equation, we can easily tell that XC that is the capacitative reactance, varies inversely as F, and a graph of XX, XC against F will always give us something like that. But then, when we dealt with the first one, which was, what was it again? The pure resistor, we saw that X and X, which is now the resistor, has nothing to do with F. They are independent of each other, therefore, X, or let me say R, is independent. R is independent, is independent of F. It has nothing to do with F, 
and therefore a graph of R against F will be something like this, a constant graph. Is that understood? Good. Now that we've covered the, 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 the other types or all components separately, I think it is just right to answer one or two questions. VRMS all over IRMS or 1 all over 2 pi FC. Since the current is not known, but then F and C are all given, we can easily use this equation. And that gives us XC is equivalent to 1 all over 2 pi. Pi is a constant which is 3.14, 2 times 3.14 times the frequency, which is 50, times the capacitance, which is 5 times 10 to the power minus 6. So x sub c will be, can we punch our calculators together? That should be 1 divided by 2 pi times 50 times 5 times exponent minus 6. And that's giving us 636.62 ohms. That's the first one. The B part says we calculate the current that flows in the circuit or through the circuit. I is not known. But again, we know I or we know V to be equivalent to I times R. But again, R is the same as x sub c. Therefore, the current will be equivalent to v all over x sub c. And that's 240 volts divided by 636.62 ohms. So 240 divided by that gives us 0. 0.377 amperes. That's the amount of current that flows through that circuit. Thank you. Okay, let's take the data, right? We are given the inductance as 45 millihenry, which is the same as 45 times 10 to the power minus 3 henrys. The voltage is given, and that is 120 volts. The frequency is 60 hertz and pi is just a constant which is 3.14 and the first question the first question says we solve for omega therefore roman figure one will be omega equals to 2 pi f you just recall this was already given in your notes and that should be 2 times pi times f which is 60 and the whole thing becomes, let's do that again, 2 times 3.14 times 60. That should be 376.8 radians per second. That's the angular frequency. And the second part requires us to do or to solve for the inductive reactance. That is X of L. That should be omega times L. Omega is found as 376.8 and L is given as 45 times 10 to the power minus 3. Therefore, XL, which is the inductive reactant, becomes 376.8 times 45 times 10 exponent minus 3. And that should be 16. Point 9, 5, 9, 16.96. We move on to the third one, which requires us to calculate the current. And we know current, current will be equivalent to V all over R from Ohm's law. But then R here is the same as the inductive reactants, XL. And in the second problem, we obtain the, re the inductive reactants 
at 16.96. Z is also given as 120 volts, so we divide the two to obtain the current. And that should be 120 divided by 16.96, and that simplifies to 7.08 amperes. So that's the end of question two. You can also verify your answers as they have been displayed on the screen. To the end of part one, see you another time for the continuation.